Citizens United case, one year ago, we said the corporations have the same rights of people to spend their money however they want on elections. There's almost no restrictions, and that's the way it should be because corporations are people. Don't you see what's happening in the United States? We voted to give the corporations even more control over our elections than they already had. And we sold out the American people one more time. I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I voted against this awful idea. I'm Justice Clarence Thomas, and I'm an Oreo. I believe my colleagues just bought the best democracy money can buy. Welcome to the Alliance for Democracies and Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I host of this series of half hour weekly public access station programs. Today our guest is Paul Cienfuegos. Paul is the founder of Democracy Unlimited of Humboldt County in Northern California. Uh, he founded that after being influenced by the thinking and writings of, of uh, Robert Grossman of, of ProClad, the program on corporate law and democracy. He established uh, Democracy Unlimited in hopes that a new way of addressing single issue campaigns might be developed to uh, to address the underlining issues which join all of those campaigns, the power, of cor the power of corporate power and rule in our democracy. So welcome to our show, Paul. Thanks for having Good. me, David. Thank you for being here. So let's, let's, uh, let's first talk about this single-payer uh, issues campaign that most activists are involved with. Single-issue? Uh, Single-issue campaigns, right, uh, versus uh, your idea of addressing the underlying issues. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we have been stuck in a regulatory structure of law as single issue activists for 30 or 40 years now. If we're battling environmental harms caused by corporations, we're pleading with regulatory agencies or our elected officials at the state and federal level. We're pleading with them to get the corporations to cause a little less harm. And the whole regulatory structure of law was designed back in the 1880s in confidential conversations between the U.S. Attorney General and the leaders of the first large or giant corporations, the railroad corporations. Mm -hmm. And the whole regulatory law structure is designed to tie we the people in knots, to make it impossible for us to have impact as the sovereign people um, with, you know, the highest power that we have. And the, I mean, we are, there is no power greater than us we the people in the United States. And the regulatory system was designed to funnel our sovereignty into uh, dead-end channels mm -hmm. and make us basically uh, incapable of, of governing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so here we are. You know, We now have environmental laws that are all regulatory and we're pleading for a little less harm. Labor law is exactly the same thing. And so for a century now, activists have been funneled into single-issue activism. And that's why we're in the mess that we're in. We can't say no to corporate harms. We can't say no to corporate activities at all mm -hmm. within the legal structure that we are allowing ourselves to be players in. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and so <laughs> your, your vision and the vision of ProClad uh, was that we should stop, not necessarily stop working on these single issue campaigns, but we should start dealing with the underlying issue. That's right. So develop that for us. So, uh, you know, you could, you could argue that Clear-cutting is not the problem. The problem is that we, the people, are allowing corporations to clear-cut. 
sending uh, factories full of living wage jobs to China is not the problem, it's a symptom of the problem. The problem is that we, the people, are allowing manufacturing corporation owners to make the decisions about where manufacturing happens. Mm -hmm. The problem is not that we have a health care crisis, that's a symptom of the problem. The problem is that we allow health care corporations and pharmaceutical corporations to make decisions about our health care. And so if you start understanding that all of these things are merely symptoms of giving decision-making authority, property rights, First Amendment rights to corporations, then you no longer focus on the specific harms, you focus on reining in the rights. Mm -hmm. And so for the last 15 years, I've been involved as close to full-time as I can in a movement that's building a, a rights-based strategy that steps outside of regulatory and zoning law and says, we the people have the right to govern ourselves at the municipal level. And that right is guaranteed to us through our state constitutions. And just to give you an example of where that right inherently comes from, here's our state constitution in Oregon. Mm -hmm. Bill of Rights, Section 1, Natural Rights Inherent in People. We declare that all power is inherent in the people and all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. And they have at all times a right to alter, reform, or abolish the government in such manner as they may think proper. That's the first paragraph of our state constitution. One state to the north, here's their first paragraph. Political power. All political power is inherent in the people, and governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. So and this is the language in every state constitution. This is the language in the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. We the people are the highest political force in the land. So when we allow ourselves to be regulated by the regulatory structure, we're, we're screwed. Mm -hmm. So we have to step out of that and say we're not willing to regulate our, our rights away. We're going to exercise our right of self-governing authority. And in more than 130 communities now across six states, on the East Coast, communities have passed laws that end all sorts of corporate activities that are legal but harmful to the communities, that strip corporations of all of their constitutional rights within the municipal boundaries of that place, and which also refuse to recognize what's called state preemption, which normally gives the state the right to uh, preempt a local community from banning things that are legal. Hmm. And so they refuse to recognize state preemption in these same ordinances because preemption violates their right of self-governance. Hmm. So this is happening okay. in 130 communities now in six states. Okay. And right. I'm helping to bring the movement to the West Coast. Excellent. Good. And so uh, give us some, uh, some uh, examples of some of these ordinances that have been passed already. So it started about uh, 10 years ago in Wells Township, Pennsylvania, a little township of 500 rural conservative farmers. It was a hog farm economy of family farms, and they were trying to stop a 15,000-head a hog farm from coming in that was a legal permitted activity, so they couldn't stop it through the regulatory system. Mm -hmm. So instead, they passed an anti-corporate farming ordinance that banned corporate agriculture in their community. And as soon as they passed it, half a dozen other conservative family farm communities passed the same thing. Fast forward a couple of years, Towns in Maine started using these ordinances to ban Nestle corporations from coming in and putting bottling plants to suck groundwater out and sell it in little plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. Move forward a couple more years, you had communities banning corporate logging, corporate mining, um, dumping of urban sewage sludge on farmland in rural communities. Um, and then just last November, the city of Pittsburgh was the first major city to pass one of these ordinances. By a vote of 9-0, to zero, unanimous, a very politically diverse city council mm -hmm. banned uh, fracking by corporations, which is the fracturing of, of bedrock to get it the natural gas seeps, which is very dangerous and very toxic. Every other community throughout the United States is trying to regulate fracking. Pittsburgh mm -hmm. banned it. They said, we can't guarantee safe water to our residents unless we say no to fracking, not regulate it around the edges. Mm -hmm. And that same ordinance stripped fracking corporations of all of their rights and also refused to recognize preemption. And then the latest thing that's happened is in Spokane, 
which has now, uh, there's a group called envisionspokane.org, envisionspokane.org, and they've been working for the last five or six years to pass a community bill of rights that does four very interesting things. The first one is uh, neighborhoods, for the first time, would have veto power over commercial and industrial developments they don't want in their neighborhoods. Hmm. So they would they would have legal authority. So this would bring it really down this to is, the local. Yes, uh -huh. these are all municipal community rights ordinances. Mm -hmm. All of these, um, it would give rights of nature to the Spokane River and Spokane Aquifer, so that you you don't you wouldn't have the authority to poison the Spokane River. That would be a violation of the river's rights. Hmm. And that is there are three dozen of these ordinances that include rights of nature clauses, among the hundred thirty that have passed. Uh, it would guarantee workers full constitutional rights while at work. Most people don't even realize that as soon as they walk into work, they lose all of their constitutional mm -hmm. rights. The corporate employer has constitutional rights, but they don't. And the fourth part of the Bill of Rights says any uh, corporate constitutional rights that interfere in the implementing of those first three rights for people in nature shall be nullified. So if it comes up in court between a corporate right and a people's right, the corporate right is hereby nullified. Mm -hmm. And they've run it twice, and they're going to run it, run it till they win. And a few weeks ago on Election Day, they came within two-thirds of a percentage point. They wow. lost by only 1,000 votes, um, which is amazing, because right. they have massive opposition from government, from business, and the, develop, the developer sector has been throwing hundreds of thousands of dollars against mm -hmm. it. And they almost won. So wow, that's year very two, impressive. They will win. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, recently, uh, within the last couple of years, there was a rights-based uh, change to the Constitution. Was it in Ecuador? Um, so Ecuador has yes. been taking okay. this, um, the rights of nature portion mm -hmm. of, of this exciting work, believe it or not, that started in Pennsylvania. The folks from Pennsylvania actually went down to Ecuador to help them right there new constitution that enshrines rights of nature. I call it reverse colonialism, Pennsylvania helping Ecuador. <laughs> oh, yeah. And here's just a few sentences from their new constitution that passed a few years ago, adopted by Congress and majority vote of the, of the voters. These are just a few short excerpts. Article 1, nature or Pachamama, where life is reproduced or exists, has the right to exist, persist, maintain itself, and regenerate its own vital cycles, structure, functions, and its evolutionary processes. Any person, people, community, or nationality may demand the observance of the rights of the natural environment before public bodies. Nature has the right to be completely restored, and the introduction of organisms and organic and inorganic material that can alter in a definitive way the national genetic heritage is prohibited. So they're fundamentally banning genetically modified organisms mm -hmm. within, the, within the entire country. First country in the world mm -hmm. to pass a constitution that enshrines rights of nature. And then Bolivia, um, just this year, is set to pass a historic law of Mother Earth, which will grant nature equal rights to humans in its constitution. And let me just read you a few sentences for that. from that. Um, it's intended to encourage a radical shift in conservation attitudes and actions to enforce new control measures on industry. The law redefines natural resources as blessings and confers the same rights to nature as to human beings, including the right to life and to exist, the right to continue vital cycles and processes free from human alteration, the right to pure water and clean air, the right to balance, the right to not be polluted, and the right to not have cellular structure modified or genetically altered. Hmm. So this is now happening in right. Bolivia. There's now an international movement of, of communities and governments that are instituting okay. rights of nature under law. Okay. And so, so when this passed in Ecuador, have there been tests of, of that in, constitution? In or, fact, uh, there have been. Uh -huh. um, the, a river sued, a human being representing a river sued a corporation that had damaged the river. It was the Vilcabamba River in Ecuador. And in the first test case since the Constitution was passed, the river won in mm -hmm. a court of law just about a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. 
in Ecuador. Wow. Well, yeah. it, it, and so the corporation has now had to cease all pollution. It does, of the and river. it has to fully pay for the restoration of the river. Mm -hmm. It's not just a fine that goes to an environmental group, mm -hmm. and then they spend it on whatever they want to spend it on. You, you, the fine, the, the money has to be paid to fully restore the damage, mm -hmm. which obviously can be an enormous amount of money. Uh, yes, uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that certainly would uh, put the fear of God into into corporations so. that are thinking that they can right. just pass those charges and right. those costs on to all of us. Right, corporate directors are going to have uh -huh. to rethink what they do in right. Ecuador. Okay, all right. So this is yeah. this is making this is corporations big. actually accountable to, really to the people who are affected by them. Yeah, and I've right. been working closely in Bellingham, Washington, for the last two years with a group uh, calling itself Local Democracy Instituting Group. And they are, uh, just a few weeks from now, or actually in late January, are going to publicly launch a campaign with a local community rights ordinance that will ban coal trains from passing through Bellingham, which is their response. This is a more powerful community rights response than, again, there's a coal train crisis that's being looked at throughout mm -hmm. the Northwest mm -hmm. of trying to stop 15 new coal trains a day each carrying 100 to 150 coal cars, open on top coal mm -hmm. cars with yep. coal dust spewing out. Right, and those will be coming through Portland. Those will be coming through a lot of communities in mm -hmm. the Northwest, and Bellingham is the first to say, we're not gonna plead with regulators or governors or the federal government or the corporations. We're gonna ban coal trains from passing through our city. Mm -hmm. We've had enough of waiting for state and federal authorities to stop these ridiculous harms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. I, I, I've heard several exciting ideas already from you today about what we could do right here in Portland and right here in Oregon. And well, one of them you mentioned Nestle. Uh, Nestle, yeah. of course, is building a or, or has a proposal hoping uh, is hoping to build a bottled water plant in Cascade Lock, That's a right. small community up up river from us. And yeah. and there's been opposition, but certainly never uh, the opposition has never focused in this direction. Of, of saying no. that, that we have rights we as don't a community. Know that we have rights. Most of mm -hmm. us are so colonized after a century of this one corporate harm at a time mentality that most of us have no idea how powerful we are. Mm -hmm. So this is a movement that's taking our power back. And to be completely frank about it, what these communities are doing is they're so they're stepping out of the regulatory and zoning arena and stepping into a rights based structure of law. And, and the reason I'm kind of bringing us back to this is the local ordinances themselves are acts of civil disobedience. They violate corporate constitutional rights. They are illegal. And they're saying there is no way for us to, or, uh, to um, exercise our democratic right of self-governance unless we step out of law and start exercising a right even if it violates corporate rights. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of harkening back to things like the abolitionist movement where, you know, the, the Constitution itself enshrines slavery. Mm -hmm. So what are the abolitionists doing? They're burning the Constitution. They're saying we have to step out of these structures of law that cannot give us justice in our, in our society. Mm -hmm. And we have to make it up ourselves because we are the highest law of the, in the land, we the people. Good. Yeah. So we have, and I'm going to change your focus just a little bit, and I'm sorry, but we'll have you on again so you can, we can continue talking about this. But we have, the Alliance for Democracy has supported the move to amend, movement to amend the Constitution to abolish corporate, um, corporate constitutional rights and to make clear that money is not speech. How do you feel about that? Um, I have real mixed feelings about it. I mean, and actually, it's to the framework of of move to amend is to abolish corporate personhood. Mm -hmm. I wish it was to abolish corporate rights because that's a much more expansive oh, framework. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, corporate personhood is only a subset. It's a major subset, but it's a subset of all of the constitutional rights corporations have won. They didn't start winning personhood rights until 1886. Mm -hmm. They'd won lots of other constitutional rights before 1886 always through the Supreme Court. So I have some issue with the frame, but my biggest concern about the Move to Amend campaign is that all the eggs are being thrown in one basket, which is counting on the House and the Senate in supermajority to mm -hmm. pass a constitutional amendment that abolishes funding of, of elections by corporations. That's mm -hmm. one of their rights. Uh -huh. And so you've got people who are in power in the House and Senate who are there 
because they got more corporate money usually than their opponent did, mm -hmm. that's usually who wins, the one who has the most money, and most money is corporate, do we really believe, do you really believe that two-thirds of the House and Senate representatives are going to vote against their personal interests to abolish corporate personhood? I don't think so. And that's the entire Move to Amend campaign is based on that strategy. So I don't see anything wrong with building a movement from the, from the bottom up to force constitutional change. But you don't pass a constitutional amendment unless you've built a massive political organization. And yeah. If you look at the women's movement in the 1970s to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, they got their supermajorities in the House and the Senate, and they needed 38 state legislatures to vote yes, and they only got 37 to mm -hmm. vote yes, and 10 years went down the drain. Mm -hmm. All that time, energy, money wasted. Yeah. Nothing to show for it. Yeah. I would rather be involved in a, in a grassroots up municipals taking their rights back movement mm -hmm. and heading towards constitutional reform from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think t talking about the Equal Rights <laughs> Amendment, I, I think they had a f what was, in my view, a fatal flaws in the thing in that they limited the amount of time that uh, that the proposed constitutional amendment could be approved well, to 10 always, years. They're always limited. N no, they don't have to be, though. Oh, that's no, and interesting. they're not always. Okay, limited. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Right, yeah. And I but again, we, do we want to take more than mm -hmm. 10 years? I mean, well, we don't want to take more than we need do we to have? do this now. You know? And I, I guess one of the things I do like about the move to amend uh, idea is that uh, they're really actively involved with creating a mass movement for democracy, which dovetails nicely with the kind of demands. You know, that, that you're asking for. I not hope that they're for, building a mass movement. I, I, I believe think they what are. <laughs> I see What I see Move to Amend doing is they're building uh, short-term campaigns in communities to get a resolution, a non-binding symbolic resolution mm -hmm. passed in the municipal level towards supporting a constitutional amendment. And, yeah, yes, and right. LA passed one unanimously just mm -hmm. last week, and that's way cool. But the question is, once L.A. passes it, what do the residents of L.A. do next? Right. If they've actually built a movement and not just a single-issue campaign, mm -hmm. there's something that happens next. And right. I would argue what happens next is a rights-based municipal ordinance. Yes. But the move to amend leadership isn't talking at all about the rights-based ordinances at all. Okay. And that's a real problem because that's the obvious next step for Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Mm -hmm. Eugene is going to pass one in a few days or weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by right. city council. Uh, yeah, and hopefully we so will there has to Portland. be a step two. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, right. Yeah, yeah. and I, I guess my vision is that you know, we get people involved at that level in doing these resolutions, or hopefully referrals, so we get the whole community involved, and then we move in this direction and, and getting the right space kind of, yeah. kind of actions started. And you know, we've already talked about several that could definitely apply here, and they would have Pretty good support, I think, right I think out the so. uh, right out the gate. And so we talked yeah. about uh, Nestle. We talked about yeah. uh, the coal trains, which are you know the coal is going to be exported to China. That's no right. benefit to us. We get the costs. Right. You know, we get the costs here when the dust comes off the coal trains, yeah. and then we get the costs when the pollution comes back over the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, and the climate so, change. And the, the climate, climate change. change. So, the thing I'm most excited about, if I have another. Oh, we have a, a couple, three minutes couple more. Minutes. Mm -hmm. right. So I, I just want to make sure that I mention that the group that I'm working closely with that's helping to write these ordinances mm -hmm. is called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, and, and their website is on the screen during this show. And they just published the Community Bill of Rights template for the Occupy movement, which is really exciting. And if you go to my website, which is also on the screen, you'll see it. Um, it's a document written by this organization that helps the Occupy movement, wherever they are in the United States, to plug in the details of what they want and end up just o almost automatically mm -hmm. with a rights-based or ordinance that isn't far from being finalized mm -hmm. in its draft language. Oh, this is and that's exciting. I'll okay. just read you a couple of the things you could choose from. And in, the sky's the limit. These are just ideas. The right to a locally-based economy. The right to affordable and safe housing the right to affordable preventative health care, the right to water, the right to sustainable food systems, the right to affordable and renewable energy, the right to constitutional protections in the workplace, 
right to determine the future of neighborhoods, the right to a free, open, and accessible internet, the right to a citizen-managed and accountable police force, the right to clean and fair elections, free from corporate interference, the right to clean government, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Right? So in the, other words, this, this is expansive. The, yes, it's it up is. to us. Mm -hmm. We are the sovereign people. Mm -hmm. Not just, we, we need to get away from what are we trying to stop in the latest corporate crisis. Mm -hmm. What do we want? Mm -hmm. yeah. We can and put this that is a on great, a right space to Great ordinance. list of things that we don't even know we don't have that we really should have as a sovereign people. And we're not organizing around right. most of this stuff. Right, yes. We're instead right. trying to put fires out all yeah. the time. And you've spent quite a bit of time at Occupy Portland yes. educating. <clears throat> yeah, I'm leading a two-hour workshop for Occupy every week. I was mm -hmm. doing it twice a week when the camp was still up. And my schedule is always on my website, paulcienfuegos.com. Mm -hmm. My next right. workshop is the 19th of December. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you very much for being here, Paul. Thank you. This is Pleasure. very excellent. Okay. Right. We will definitely have you back. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we've got uh, some graphics that we're going to put up on the screen. Um, and the first one, uh, uh, Paul mentioned the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Uh, their website uh, is uh, www.celdf.org. Paul's website, of course, is paulcienfuegos.com. Uh, and then Paul has a bookstore. So if you uh, have been buying your books at, uh, the, at corporate bookstores, we would highly encourage you to, to check out Paul's bookstore. It's online at www.100fires.com. Uh, lots of uh, fine selections, climate change, corporate rule, capitalism, history, local, local, global, human and civil rights, and a lot of other topics, media, so forth. Uh, Paul will be leading a workshop here in Portland on January 14th and 15th, a two-day workshop, and we encourage you to also attend that. We the people are more powerful than we dare to believe. First steps in dismantling corporate rule. I have attended uh, Paul's workshop before. They are excellent and I highly encourage you. You do need to pre-register uh, with Paul at paul at 100fires.com and you'll get further details from, from that. Um, let's see, so that is, uh, that is it for today. Uh, if your local public access station does not uh, broadcast populist dialogues, please contact the station and request that they broadcast this show and other populist dialogue episodes. Populist dialogues are available to them at no charge at www.pegmedia.org. Want to join the crew here at the Alliance for Democracy Populist Dialogues? Please contact me at davidafd at ymail.com. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more at our national websites, www.thealliancefordemocracy.org, or our Portland website, www.afd-pdx.org. Thanks to our crew today, which has been Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Hollis Benedict, and Janice Morris. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next week.